let's open it up to questions. So I think we'll do the same. Be fairly succinct, I think, with your questions, and we'll, we'll take three at a time and then get panel response. Carol Willis, Menethia. Um, I wanted to pick up on this point about education and whether it's a driver for social mobility. And just to clarify my understanding of what the panel have said, um, because it's certainly the case that uh, changes in education and the outcomes for young people haven't yet delivered uh, better educational outcomes and uh, equality in society. But I don't think you were saying that it couldn't. It's right, isn't it, that uh, educational outcomes are still highly correlated with, uh, work with wages, with earnings, and isn't the challenge still to see how we can improve educational outcomes for those uh, people from uh, low social backgrounds, rather than assuming that can't happen or shouldn't happen, or that it's, it's never going to work. My name is Ros McNeil. I'm from the National Union of Teachers. I thought that was an absolutely fantastic panel. Such good ideas. I was really pleased that Selena said, how do we value jobs? Because all day I've been thinking that we're just conflating high income jobs with high value jobs. And that can't be right. Why aren't we talking about nursing and about teaching as really high value jobs to society? And yes, the, the future of work is changing, but it needs to be human. And so there will be jobs based on nurturing and caring with huge value to society. So I thought that was fantastic. And really good to get the issues in, I think, from the panel about the labels, the language we're using about deprived kids, disadvantaged communities. So my question is, yes, social mobility uh, can't be a policy goal in itself, but we haven't, have we, have we given equality as a goal to the education system? I don't think we've had. Every Child Matters was the closest we got to setting up some really holistic goals for education as a system. It was a wide vision. Do you feel we have a vision at the moment which is holistic? which gives the system a chance of delivering on equity and equality through education. Okay. Hi, I'm Katie from Oxera. Um, I was interested that this morning Justine Greening seemed to suggest that expanding um, university places was good for people from low income backgrounds, but one of the comments on the panel seemed to suggest that actually that helps the wealthiest. Is there any sort of consensus about whether expanding university places is good or bad for social mobility? Okay, thank you. So I'm, I'll start with John first, actually. So there's, there's something about uh, could we have a, a stronger sort of emphasis on equality as a mission for education? Perhaps we need to clarify that more and think about that through. There's can education improve social mobility or equalise to some extent? And then we've got that connects to that the university expansion. Can, can, can that help? Um, these two things rather go against themselves because. What a good deal of sociological research has shown is this, that as you expand a certain level of education, let's say now tertiary education, at the same time as that level expands, it becomes increasingly stratified. Um, there's better and worse. So the quality varies increasingly as you expand a level. And I think we've seen that now with tertiary education. And what then happens is that children from more advantaged backgrounds disproportionately go to the higher, better quality <laughs> levels within that, uh, w within that field. Um, so th this is always the problem, that if you create greater variation in quality at a particular educational level, then the inequalities uh, really stay the same. I mean, if, for example, you just take all British universities as one block, university education. There is some evidence that the association between children's uh, social background and going to university has weakened. But then stratify that uh, tertiary sector on any of the possible lines, Russell Group, uh, uh, modern universities, whatever. Once you stratify it, you find that the inequalities have scarcely changed at all. There's an excellent uh, paper by um, a former student of mine, Vicky Bolivar, now at uh, Durham, on this. So th th this is the problem, that um, whatever you do in field of education, uh, parents with greater resources will seek to maintain their children's competitive edge within the system. So just to push you though, John, on that, because I think that's historical, and I know you've documented yeah. that, but, but in your opinion, what would you do then to change that? What could you do? I, 
think it's very difficult in, 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 in a liberal uh, uh, democracy to do that. Sun Trust has done some, um, I mean, you've promoted some very good research on this, on parent power, on the shadow education system. Sure. I mean, what, what can you really do to stop, say, uh, better you, off you could parents? You have randomization in school Sorry? admissions. You could, you, so instead of having selection, you could have, I know, a threshold, a certain academic threshold for universities, and over and above that, you randomly assign people. That I would be, uh, you, you could do that. Right. Uh, uh, I've uh, well, I found something. I would, or rather, let me say, you could propose it. <laughs> <laughs> and, and then you then get get all the flack from Oxbridge. I, I, I have actually suggested this with, with, within Oxford, and of course the establishment were on me like a ton of bricks. Um, you know, there are just built in vested interests okay. here. And in our kind of society, a liberal democracy, there are limits to what what, what, what I think you can do. Okay. I mean, there's a, can I just say one thing? There's a very interesting hypothesis in the sociological <laughs> literature. And we suggest that across all societies, with market economies, liberal democratic polities, and a nuclear family system, relative rates of social mobility don't vary very much. Okay. And I think there's a lot in that. Selena, do you want to respond to those sure. questions about education? Yeah, um, I think that I, I agree with John that, that it's very hard to change some of these things, mm. but, but the Sutton Trust has always been about saying we need to raise ambition and aspiration. And I, th I think that we have to be very ambitious at a volatile political time. But that means looking at the top, not the bottom, like I said. And in terms of thinking about the way in which education can help people, not necessarily in terms of climbing the social ladder, because as I've said, I think we should be thinking more about equality and fairness and enabling um, a, an arbitrary few, which is what it always is, um, to get on. Um, one of the ways of doing that is to, is to think very carefully about how we assess the word that John used, quality, in terms of higher education and also um, mainstream education as well. I think most of us would agree that Ofsted, um, the research valuation framework, the new TEF within higher education, are not great ways of measuring quality. And certainly in terms of HE, they always, they're always manipulated to favour the usual suspects, i.e. the Russell Group, and particularly Oxbridge. Can I so, just point out to you that LSE only got a bronze in its, its teaching <laughs> evaluation. Uh, yeah, because this is the first time round. And actually, Oxford bombed in history the first time round the ref was done. The ref was subsequently changed to make sure we didn't. Yeah, <laughs> So we need to have a much more independent, a much more accountable way of assessing assessing quality, which voters want, but it needs to be um, differently done, dem more democratically done. I would argue that we need more bolstering of local government, of local democracy, and that, that we need more local government intervention in areas like education, including higher education. I don't think it did the old pollies any harm to come under local government, and the Russell Group would benefit from some oversight there as well. So I think that that's, that's one way in which we could address it. In terms of whether education can be a driver for change, yeah, historically it's been a great driver for change for middle class women, and I'm not saying that in a derogatory way. Middle class men have had huge advantages in the employment market. And middle class women have been able to compensate for that. I think that Anna was touching on this, but in a much more nuanced way than I can, in terms of getting qualifications and, and accreditation. Um, more generally, though, in terms of working class uplift, adult education was a major driver right through the 20th century. We don't know much about it because nobody ever wants to research or talk about adult education. Adult education is decimated, and I think if we were going to do one thing, we'd invest in that. It's also a model for flexibility within education. We're constantly talking about how workers have to be flexible. Our education system has become less and less flexible. It's very, very hard now to go back into education at later stages of life for short courses or to dip in and out. We really need to reinvent that using organisations like the Open University right. and Adult Education. Okay. Then just finally, in terms of um, the point that our colleague from the NUT made about whether in terms of, of high-value jobs and, and education more generally, there's anything out there that can, that can offer equality. My understanding is that in polling, equality is not polling very well. But fairness is, and not, not fairness at entry level, but just fairness generally in terms of, of education. And to my mind, the labour offer of a national education service, that's a really good starting point. Okay, Anna. So I remember the first time I heard a politician talk about uh, the government prioritising uh, relative social mobility, and I think there was an intake of breath at that point, um, because relative 
social mobility to me has always seemed ambitious. Um, but I think we're really in danger of here of missing the main point, which is education can play a key role in creating the conditions in your economy, your society that brings all sorts of benefits, social, economic, hopefully productivity, hopefully GDP growth, hopefully defence against the technology onslaught that we were talking about earlier that we may or may not believe in. But in general, education is what we have uh, to allow people to develop the skills that can help them cope with all of that. And our most successful period obviously came about when we created more room at the top. So in answer to your question about expanding university places, no, expanding good jobs is what will improve absolute social mobility and make everybody feel better. Failing that, making the feeling and the experience of being at the top and the bottom much more similar may also reduce some of the negative aspects that we're seeing at the moment between the very, very different experiences of children who are going through from the top of the distribution versus the, the bottom of the, the parental income distribution. So going back to Carol's point, you know, education has not been a major driver for relative social mobility, if that's what you're asking, but I think that does not mean that we shouldn't invest in it and treat it very seriously as a potential lever to improve a lot of things, including absolute social mobility. Steve, just because you all know this paper as well, there is a paper on Finland that shows that... Oh, you've got it. All right, good. So you're going to talk about that. Because I think there is a, I was some say, facts yeah. on there that shows that education can, in the right context, okay. can, can do something. So I was going to so say, I, I mean, I didn't want to go too far in my talk and, say, and give the impression that education doesn't matter, because of course it does. And, and of course education policy can be equalising. Um, as, as Selena said, some, some episodes from the past in Britain show that and I was going to say also there are some other places that you can look at where that has been seen I was going to say Finland uh, which is uh, to, uh, until relatively recently it has been at the top of the PISA rankings uh, actually until Shanghai came in I think uh, and Singapore uh, but it's still pretty high up there and education is very equal there you know people go to their local school uh, they don't care which school their kids go to um, you know and, uh, and there's no house price premium for living near a particular school um, and they seem to deliver quite well, and they also have a very reduced inequality in the labour market subsequently. Um, I've, I've, heard this, I've heard this said at an American conference on, uh, on, on America, in, 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 uh, well, in the US about these things, and then somebody just chipped in and said, but they're all the same. You know, <laughs> it's a small country and everybody's the same. But, you know, it is a small country, so how much you want to generalise from the experience of Finland, I don't know. But there are settings where you can see. Um, see things. But just because um, of the paper I saw said there was a change in education. This is Marcus Yanti, I think, and that did improve mobility. I think it's, it's for Thomas Pecorino. Yeah. 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 So, so yeah, it just, I just, what I'm saying is. They it, went to a comprehensive education system. And it, they went to a comprehensive education system and it, and it, and it improved equality. So yeah. we might be giving a hard time. To, well, I think we are giving a hard time to education but because it might be actually counterbalancing the huge inequalities we have in this society, right? Yeah, I mean, I think so, you, you can find you can find settings about that being one of them. There's other settings you can find in other parts of the world as well, okay. where education can be equalising. What I would say is, I think, it, given the climb, the current position in Britain, it's really hard. To, I mean, the vested interest thing is completely right. It's really hard to imagine how education policy could be made equalising. Not with that, I would love, I would love people to, but I would, I'd love people to have a go in a really serious way. But it seems to me that redistributive policies about adults are more feasible yeah. to generate something, to generate income gains for low-income parents. Mm -hmm. uh, perhaps, perhaps kind of progressive uh, policies. I mean, tax credits have been pretty redistributive. Um, or perhaps by place, a bit more radically, you could actually have think about you know trying to improve demand conditions for employers in certain places as well. Those kind of redistributive policies seem to me, at least, to be more feasible than the massive shift that needs to take place to deliver on education policy. But maybe I'm just being overly overly negative. The other the other point I think I think about the future jobs uh, is particularly important, and we're not valuing what some of the future jobs would be, particularly in health. But one key thing that just needs to be done, I mean, austerity was just terrible on this. I mean, cutting local authority funding for social care was just been an absolute disaster. And why it was ever allowed to take place, I do, I do not know, but it, but it did. And that needs to be reversed completely. OK, yeah. right. More questions. We do, of course, have one strong and socially redistributive policy in the education system at the moment called the pupil premium. Uh, which really interestingly, you know, we've got to this point of the day and I don't think we've heard it referred to once. Um, can we hear the panel's views about that? 
Ellen Austin from the London School of Economics Widening Participation Team. Um, really fascinating, if slightly deflating, um, set of presentations. Um, and I am wondering if the panel have any views on what people like me um, in universities working on and believing strongly in an agenda of increasing social mobility um, could be doing within the environment that we're working in, given that what we're doing at the moment maybe isn't working as well as we might hope. Okay. Um, Jane Waldfogel from Columbia University and LSC. I, I just wanted to make a comment about the Finland work. Um, I think it's actually quite relevant to both the US and the UK uh, because part of what they did was raise the minimum level that you needed to have in terms of skills to graduate secondary school. And some huge proportion of students there, 40 or 50 percent, at some point received special assistance to get to that competency level. But they said basically if you're going to graduate from secondary school, everybody's got to achieve a minimum level of skill. So it, it does sort of fit in with the idea of raising skill levels for those who may not be going on to university. Um, and it, it seems to chime in well with what the public perception was. We saw, heard earlier this morning the public's very strongly in favor of improving comprehensive education. And in a setting here where you have a national curriculum and national standards, it seems more feasible than it would be in the United States. Um, I also really liked um, hearing about upskilling of jobs, and uh, this is something we've been talking about in the States as well, in the, in the context of childcare jobs. Because then you have really, it's at least a triple dividend. So you're raising the wages and working conditions of low-skilled young people who work in the childcare sector. You're also getting a dividend in terms of child development, and you're getting a dividend in terms of family incomes of those workers. Uh, so. Uh, that, that seems a, a promising area in addition to we've been talking about other caring workers okay. and teaching workers. Right, so um, I'm going to start this way this time. So Steve, some different questions here. I think pupil premium, can you just respond to that? Amazing policy actually when you go to international conferences, other countries really look enviously at, 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 in terms of that. Uh, there's the, there's the what, what would you advise a hard-working access uh, professional at the LSE and other uh, in institutions in, in terms of what they should be doing. And then there's Jane's sort of uh, wider comments already. I suppose, yeah, could we, could yeah. we follow on from Finland in that way? Or, uh, so, so any responses to those? Yeah, all of them. Um, so pupil premium stuff, I don't think we've, I mean, Becky may know better than me, but I don't think we've got a very good evaluation of that yet, possibly because it hasn't been running long enough to see longer term outcomes to establish what, what it what it does um, you would expect it to well if you I mean if you, if you expect if you think spending more money on on particular groups delivers so of course some, some people who think that spending money isn't the right thing might think it won't deliver but I, I don't think we have enough evidence on that to date really um, on the widening participation thing at LSE, of course, there's, I'm sure there's huge amounts of success stories at LSE actually on that. On that. Um, but uh, no, but on, I mean, in, I mean, more, more seriously, um, I mean, I mean, I think you can take a more micro point of view. So the point about education being disequalizing is an average argument. But on average, it's been disequalizing. Of course, within that, there are some success stories and indeed some failure stories. And I think looking at more detail about what the success stories are has to be the experience for thinking thinking about that a bit more. Um, I completely agree about the jobs thing. I mean, I said it a minute ago anyway. Um, of course, almost all those jobs, the kind of jobs you're referring to, you know, social care, care assistance, people working in childcare centres, are almost all minimum wage jobs right now um, in, in, in Britain, at least until people might get promoted up to a supervisory level. Um, and, uh, and they've been put under more pressure, of course, with the minimum wage going up by quite a lot. And, and not, 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 not because that's necessarily a bad thing, and there's no evidence at all that, it, that it's a bad thing, but what that has served to do is make the rates of pay of those jobs essentially be established rate, which may have a negative consequence because it's much more difficult for people to get promoted and have proper career development. So I don't think it can just be a matter of upgrading the pay. It, it's a matter of upskilling and offering proper career development tracks. Within, within those jobs, if, if, if you like, a kind of even a professionalization of those kinds of important jobs that really should be paid a lot in society. You know, I mean, you know, another thing about some of them is they're not particularly nice jobs, and you would think that people should get a compensating differential for, for, for working in you know, right. jobs in not very good conditions okay. and so on as well. Thanks, Steve. Anna? So the people premium is interesting. I mean, you said it's amazing. Actually, we've already got a redistributive 
funding system. So the people premium is just a more visible yeah, version it's, of what you're doing explicit, everywhere. Yeah. It's more explicit. But underneath it, or we've already been funding the poorest students at much higher rates, variable but higher, um, for many years. Um, and so I guess one argument is if that was going to solve the relative social mobility problem, it would have done so already. But I think that's thinking about it the wrong way because we, we, we're just assuming here for a moment that education's main goal is relative social mobility, mm -hmm. which is sort of the question that you were asking about is what widening participation activity at university useful? Yes, really, it is because you are opening up education, you're improving the skills, and there's some tentative evidence that people premium is, is boosting the skills of some students, but it's very, very patchy. Um, we, we have got ways that we can continue to work on the skills of the poorest in our society, and we should continue to do that, as long as we're not necessarily expecting the rest of society to stay still while we do. But, it, you know, you, you've got to do both, right? And then coming to the Finland issue, I mean, that's an interesting one because we already have supposed accountability systems and lots of testing and an attempt at minimum standards. And so one, I think it illustrates the difficulty of comparing Finland to us because you would have to think about uh, how we hold our schools accountable. Why is it with a lot of accountability we still have people leaving school with very, very low levels of skill? How do you fix that? And none of that will make any difference if at the end of the education pipeline in secondary, you have a highly stratified higher education system that basically does it on the basis of grade because you'd still then end up with a, you know, a beautifully sorted system by grades and those inevitably are correlated with socioeconomic background. So, so my own view is it's not depressing about education. It's just recognising the many benefits you get from education, even if relative social mobility isn't one of them. Okay. Um, so in terms of the pupil premium, yeah, great. But I think we need to look at policy as a whole. And I'm afraid I'm rather cynical about the pupil premium when it goes alongside massive tax rebates for private schools. Um, and I just think that the way in which um, education is being underinvested in at the moment is disgraceful. Um, and however much the pupil premium does, it cannot overcome that. And that's something that really needs to be to be addressed. And that segues into this point about, about Finland, where I think that there is a huge amount to learn from Finland, not least because they did take on vested interests. I think within Britain, we have a way of thinking that our establishment is somehow um, uh, cleverer than anybody else's. But in fact, in Finland, they, they really took the bull by the horns and said, we are, you know, we are not willing to put up with the private sector within education, but they were also introducing a whole raft of measures to increase socioeconomic equality more broadly, um, which is something that we really need to take on. That links into this question about what people who are working in widening participation and access schemes within, within higher education can do, because something that I think they were very successful at in Finland was suggesting that not only did people have to meet minimum targets academically, but that also that education at all levels should have social as well as academic objectives. Now, at various points in recent history, Britain's been quite good at suggesting that in mainstream state education, social objectives should be part of it, and in fact, perhaps We've overemphasized that um, and underemphasized the great intellectual work that comprehensive schools have done, which I'll come on to shortly. But in terms of higher education, I think we could do more to say that it should have social objectives, which the old polytechnics did, and that's something that people could do. The other thing that could be done within higher education is to make the point that taking children from comprehensive schools and working class backgrounds is not taking on a risk. I teach at St Hilda's College in Oxford. This year, yet again, the history students there got the best degree results of any Oxford college. They're all from comprehensives, and most of them have got WP flags coming out of their ears. If we talk about bad schools and disadvantaged children, we immediately put colleagues off from admitting those kids. And actually, what we should be doing is saying, you have no reason not to admit these children. They're going to benefit your institution. We're not doing them a favor. The reverse is true. And just finally on that, the other thing that I'd really like to see people doing in terms of access and WP in higher education is vetting some of these social mobility schemes that they're aimed to get our widening participant graduates into certain jobs. Goes back to this point about what the top jobs are. Year on year, um, I counsel people who are graduating who came to us from working class areas in Greater London or Manchester who tell me that they're part of a BME scheme or a WP scheme aiming to get them into the city. And they are told that becoming a teacher, becoming a nurse, going into... Um, caring professions will be letting the side down, that top jobs are in the city. We really need to vet some of these programs that are out okay, there. Okay, right. John. 
Yeah, I think it's important here when we're talking about school effects to make a distinction between school effects on the general level of performance and school effects on variance in performance among the children in the schools. Now, if you're looking at school effects on the general level of education, they're obviously very important. School budgets, quality of teaching, pedagogical methods, leadership, and so on, clearly. But when you look at what is the importance of school effects, specifically school effects, on variance in children's performance, not the general level, the variance, then this is a difficult matter to investigate, but all the research I know is that school effects on variance in uh, performance are not very great. Something like 10% of the variance uh, in children's performance can be attributed to various features of the schools themselves. The large part of the remainder relates to individual characteristics of the children, including, of course, quite importantly, their social background. Now, okay, if you can uh, get this 10% school effect reducing the variance, that's worth having. But I do feel that in a lot of debate at the present time, far too much, as it were, weight is being put on education. Education is being asked to deliver mm -hmm. what it cannot in itself deliver in the social context in which it has to operate. I agree entirely with what Anna said about all the other important aspects of education quite separately from what it might or might not do in promotion social mobility. These are very important. But to ask education uh, in itself to try and compensate for some of the massive forms of inequality that exist in our society today, I think is to impose a quite undue and improper burden on education. Right. Thank you. Well, with that challenge, we're back here. I just want to show our appreciation for some brilliant excellence.